Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Christian Harloff. Yeah, boy! <laughs> Welcome back to Collider Movie Talk. Happy to have you guys back. Gonna be a lot of fun. Great panel today. Also joining us, John Schnepp. Peace. <laughs> what up, brother? Now, what's going on? And also joining us, Clark Wolf. Hello, everyone. All right. Before we get started, we've been letting you guys know about the Comic Con contest that we have running over at Collider.com. Make sure you guys enter. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm very happy that we're able to do this for some fans. As you know, it's hard to get tickets. So here is what we are offering you guys. You guys can win airfare for two to San Diego, California. There are two badges to San Diego Comic-Con, accommodations at a hotel located on the San Diego Comic-Con shuttle route, and $250 gift card for meals, transit, whatever your heart desires. Go on over to Clutter.com, enter, try to win. It'll be worth it. All right, a lot to talk about today. Natasha, what's up first? Well, the official word is out. Disney and Lucasfilm will be working on a fifth entry in the Indiana Jones franchise, with Steven Spielberg officially in the director's chair and Harrison Ford back as the famous archaeologist. But what about the franchise after the fifth chapter? How long can Harrison keep wielding that whip before he's officially too old? Shedding some light on all of its Disney uh, CEO, Bob Iger, in an interview with THR, Iger was asked if there would be a sort of shared universe with Indy a la Star Wars, to which he said, not like Star Wars, no, but we hope right now we're focused on a reboot or a continuum and then a reboot of some sort. Regarding Ford's involvement moving forward and of the possibilities of more Indiana Jones films moving forward, he said, well, we'll bring them back. We'll bring him back. Then we have to figure out what comes next. That's what I mean. It's not really a reboot. It's a boot, a reboot. I don't know. I don't think it reaches the scale of the universe of Star Wars, but I see making more. I won't be. It won't be just a one off. The fifth and still untitled Indiana Jones movie will be released July 19th, 2019, with Spielberg returning to direct a script from his Jurassic Park scribe, David Coop. For good measure, original composer John Williams will also be returning. Christian, what do you think about Iger's comments about the future of Indiana Jones Part 5, after well, Part 5? Well, I think it makes sense that they were going to want to make more, but I also think, I'm starting to think that my fantasy idea is starting to become a reality. And if you guys aren't familiar with what I had been saying about this, I think that in this new version of Indiana Jones, we're gonna get a flashback similar to what we did with River Phoenix in The Last Crusade. And whether that's someone like Chris Pratt or Bradley Cooper, I, I happen to think it's gonna be Chris Pratt from the early rumors that we had heard. But if we have Harrison Ford starring in this one, but we flash back and we see a younger version, let's say for argument's sake, it's Chris Pratt, that's where the not necessarily reboot's going to take place, the <clears throat> continuation as we accept this new version of Indiana Jones in the flashback, we'll want to see more of them kind of taking on the mantle, similar to what Aldenreich is doing as Han Solo. So I think that that's kind of what they're saying here. I don't think they should reboot it. I think that he was trying to find the words for it because it's like a continuation on. It's like, hey, we are going to actually be telling more stories with the younger Indiana Jones, but we got to get you guys familiar with that person, and we'll do it by... Harrison Ford passing the torch. I really think that's going to happen. And I'm going to say movie talk is the reason that it's happening because I think that they watched us talk about it and they like the <laughs> idea. So that's what I'm telling myself anyway. Clark, how do you like these comments? Yeah, I agree with you where I think that Iger um, was just trying to find the words. I feel like that's a very common question. What is a reboot, a requel, a sequel, a right. prequel, all of these different right. words. So I don't think he's saying we're going to throw out all the old Indiana Jones and just start all over again. But with that being said, I think you're onto something with the young Indiana Jones idea and um, but at the same time if I'm being honest and I'm a lifelong fan of Indiana Jones I would not be mad if this was kind of a if they took us into an adventure in a James Bond style thing where it was just you know have somebody else play Indiana Jones I think Harrison Ford played him as long as he physically could it's going to be five movies going into his 70s or however old Harrison Ford is so it's it's I think his time has come and I'm just saying that as a fan I wouldn't personally be upset if if they were to say, hey, somebody else is going to play Indiana Jones and not, you know, another archaeologist or something. No, like that's that. where I think they're going to do, yeah. too. I don't think they're going to do it. I don't I definitely don't think they should do another archaeologist. I think they're going to flashback, say this is who his version of Indiana Jones, young Indiana Jones is now, again, Chris Pratt. Mm -hmm. So we'll get used to that five, ten minutes of screen time and go, oh, we actually want to see a whole movie with that guy, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, this is his son, Mutt. Would you right. like to see a movie? No. Um, how do you feel about these comments? 
Well, I mean, I'm going to go with what Spielberg said. He said no one is going to play Indiana Jones except Harrison Ford. And he laid that down, and that's what I truly believe. And I don't think you're going to see anybody else play Indiana Jones. So you I don't think, believe Bob No, I don't. Oh. I think a reboot or a continuum or a boot or whatever he's talking about, um, I think what he's talking about is like within this fifth Indiana Jones, we're going to see another team of archaeologists. Oh. And I said this last week, and we're basically going to go back to the Raiders like he like we'll see it we'll see a like probably a like a computerized like younger version of Harrison Ford with a team of other raiders doing some kind of you know archaeological dig quest or something which will open the door to a sixth movie being called Raiders of the whatever the Lost City of Atlantis or whatever and you'll have this brand new team that we're introduced to in this flashback that's what I would like to see I would don't want to see someone else play Indiana Jones. I mean, but you know, whatever. Eventually, 10 years from now, they could do that. I'm just saying right now, if they want to make a sixth one, they should go Indiana Jones and the whatever, whatever, they're going to own this one. And then the sixth one could be Raiders of the something, something. And I think that would be dope. Interesting. Okay. Uh, What's next? With Marvel leading the charge with its shared universe and DC's own expanded slate of films just getting started, another connected cinematic offering has yet to get started, that of Universal's monster movie universe, which will be kicked off with The Mummy starring Tom Cruise. And while we wait to see how this on-screen world takes shape, one rumor in particular is gaining some traction. According to a report from Deadline, Universal is eyeing Dwayne The Rock Johnson to start in the Wolfman reboot of the horror classic in the title role. The report barely mentions anything else as far as the specifics of the project, so it's unclear what approach the studio will be taking for the retelling or who else will be involved in front of or behind the camera. But seeing as The Rock's schedule is packed at the moment, we'll have to wait and see how serious Universal is about mounting this particular story. Miss Wolf, can you see The Rock playing the Wolfman in Universal's shared universe of monster movies? My fellow Wolf. Uh, (laughs) So here's the thing. When you look at the slate that has been rumored or confirmed for what Warner or I'm sorry, Universal is trying to do. They're in the business of movie stars. They have Tom Cruise. Uh, they have Johnny Depp. They are allegedly going after Angelina Jolie. Russell Crow. Uh, what was Russell Crowe for? Russell Crowe's going to be in uh, Doctor Jekyll. Yeah, he's going to be. He's going to be in the same movie with Tom Cruise. Yeah. Is that confirmed? Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. That, I had not heard that. Yeah. Okay, so that there's yeah. that too. Yeah. Uh, but so Dwayne The Rock Johnson, I think, absolutely fits in with the rest of this team of of people that they're assembling. And you guys who watch Movie Talk know I love The Rock. I think he can do no wrong. However, the Wolfman that I would like to see is a really tragic and dramatic story, right? With some great effects, obviously. But you know, this is this is a he's it's a change. He's he's altering. He's tra- curse. Yeah, he's a curse. Thank you, thank you, Schnepp. So um. So I don't know if The Rock has the chops to bring that kind of uh, portrayal to the big screen. And and this is, again, I'm not hating on him. I've never seen him in a role where I felt like he was, you know, in, able to do, what, do something like that. Have you seen either Snitch or Faster? No. I would suggest watching those two because those are the movies to me that I would have been on that same wavelength with you had I not seen those two movies. Mm-hmm. His chops have been getting better. Sure. He has been doing he's he's a guy that even from his wrestling days in now, like he is a guy that continues to work hard and is always trying to work. Hence, another story about The Rock getting cast in something. I almost think it's a practical joke at right. this point because, like, every day, it's almost I, the audience can be like, no, Movie Talk's making this up. There's no right. way Rock can be considered again for another one. It's becoming a little like, all right, fine. Even when I read it this morning, I'm like, oh, come on, again? I know. It's like, it's I like The Rock. He's one of my favorite guys out there. And I think that you're absolutely right. What Universal's doing, sticking all these big movie stars, when we have our conversations about movie stars can't necessarily open movies um, but there are a few that still have that kind of draw Tom Cruise certainly won they got him the rock is someone Definitely. they got him so it, it it makes it makes sense that they would go after him to do that plus of his relationship with Universal already with the, the furious movies so I understand I get why they would go after him it's just it's also if he's putting all these things on his plate because you remember when things are announced they don't always happen mm-hmm. when things are signed doesn't mean we're going to see these things. So The Rock is maybe lining up the ones maybe the, and, and announcing it and putting his name out there. He's certainly everyone's talking about him every day in this movie space. We're always hearing about new things he's doing every week. Every I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's like, like I'm not joking. Like, it's I, went, like, I read that this morning. I was like, 
I felt like, is this a joke? Because right. like, literally, I'm not kidding. The last seven weeks, we've talked about The Rock in a different movie every week. And it's but every it's, week. and it's movies. It's television. The guy is everywhere now. There are questions that happen that we get often on mailbags, like when do, do stars kind of burn out? When do we get sick of them? The saturation. The oversaturation. But the thing is, we haven't, besides Central Intelligence, was the last movie that has come out that he's in. Obviously, he's got ballers on television, but right. maybe they're spaced out in a way that it, it's, it's good strategic. Do I think he can pull off the Wolfman? I do think he can pull off the Wolfman because I also don't think we're going to get into that Jack Nicholson or Benicio Del Toro type mm -hmm. Wolfman where you have to really go that far into it. I think it's going to be a little bit more in the big budget blockbuster, not the full Brendan Fraser mummy aspect, but a kind of counterbalance of those two. And I think The Rock is perfect for that role. So I'd be okay with it. I just, again, every time we come up with a rock story, it's space it out for me before you give me 732,000 projects the guy's doing. Right. I think, I mean, you know, like we talked about San Andreas 2 last right. week. Uh, you know, he's got Baywatch. He's got, you know, he's got every a sequel. Hobbs is coming out right. like a sequel right. to the. So he's got, you know, and Doc Savage. Well, the point I did, not the point I did, but Lud the other Ludlum movies. Yeah, and the yeah. Ludlum trilogy. I mean, trilogy, literally, right. I wasn't joking because I looked back, it was like we talked about a different rock movie every week, which is great for The Rock. And I think he's super talented. And I agree with you. Faster is an incredible film. No one's seen it, it's underrated. And he's he plays a much darker character in it. So I think. I have no problems with The Rock at all. I think he's always fun to see in any movie. Uh, I don't I don't have a problem with him being cast as the Wolfman or what. I mean, I don't know what they're doing with the Universal Monsters uh, movies. I do know that they are talk when they first talked about it was what I was kind of worried about, where they were like, well, look at what Marvel's doing. It's like, what are you, you know, it was just they're going to try to make all these uh, monsters into superheroes and make like a super team, of like mm -hmm. an Avengers, but with having all of them in there. It really depends on how the mummy and the tone of the mummy and what are what are they really going for? Because um, that Dracula Untold thing, I don't think that's going to be part of. It was supposed to launch the Universal Monsters, but it didn't. So it's not going to be part of that. So um, seeing The Rock as the Wolfman is very strange and weird. The thought of that and it does connotate it's going to have a little bit more action in it because that's why you're casting this big giant dude right. um but it's exciting in a certain sense because i don't really know what they're doing so until those other films come out i'm intrigued if you know? i can wait just add one more thing um the script that we know that they've ordered is from aaron guzikowski mm. who wrote prisoners um mm. and he wrote the uh, sundance drama the red road starring jason momoa mm. both of those pieces are very dark yeah, they're more and deep. they are and and that's so that's part of the reason sure. why i was sort of you know be, so for instance if they had said jason momoa is attached to play the wolfman and not just because he's already played a werewolf in another movie I would be like, okay, I'm interested. Oh, in really? This. You think Momoa's got better chops than The Rock? It's not about chop. No, no, no. Let me be very clear. The Rock is multi-talented. The Rock is an entertainer. The Rock, I've you know, I've seen him play quiet moments, yeah. sure, and I've seen him play funny moments and big moments. Um, what I'm talking about is darkness. Yeah. I'm talking about fear. I'm not afraid of The Rock. And The Rock is, um, you know, especially considering the Scorpion King. That's a fun little Easter yeah. egg. He's already yeah. in the monster yeah. universe. Um, but, but so what I'm saying is the Wolfman that I want to see is going to be, would be a darker story, pairings up with a Guzikowski style story. And so I, that's what I'm saying. The Rock doesn't scare me, but someone like Jason Momoa is dangerous. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Um, you know, some great suggestions here, by the way. I think that I saw a couple names going into some more kind of classy, not that the Rock isn't classy, but you know, more of those kind of classically trained actors, I guess. Idris Elba, somebody would be interesting. Uh, Christian Bale and Jude Law were three names I saw in there. That nice, I thought yeah. were, three good names. I thought were pretty good names. Okay, what's next? All right, well, a lot was said about Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice and about director Zack Snyder and his future with the DC Extended Universe. Given that Justice League began filming weeks after Batman v Superman was released, the <laughs> filmmaker was already hard at work on the follow-up when a fair amount of backlash began. When Collider's own Steve Weintraub visited the London set of Justice League last week, Snyder was asked if he's been under more corporate pressure this time around, a claim Snyder quickly debunked saying that he had a great time making the movie and that Warner Brothers didn't have 
have some sort of corporate mandate to get Batman and Superman in the movie, that the studio is a filmmaker-driven studio, and when he spoke about the new co-head of DC Films, Jeff Johns, said to reveal that they have a great working relationship, so good in fact they have a project that they're doing together, which Snyder then quickly said he can't talk about. Whether this project is another movie in the DCEU or something else entirely remains to be unseen. Schnapp, do you think Zack Snyder and Jeff Johns are making another DC film together, or is it something else? Uh, my guess is that they are developing a Watchmen series for HBO. That would be my guess because uh, it was rumored about that like a year or two ago that they were going to try to do an extended version and maybe I don't know if they're going to just redo it from scratch or they're going to you know kind of take what he already made and extend that into like ten or twenty episodes. But I think that's what him and Johns are working on. They've already brought back the Watchmen in the DC Rebirth comic books. So I think that, if anything, if there's a secret uh, thing that they're working on that no one's going to know about, it's probably something that already dropped that they're like, up, up, you know, like he was actually talking about it. And then his wife was like, up, 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 up. And, you know, she shut him up. It's like, oh, that's right. I can't talk about that yet. So that's my guess is they're going to do an extended Watchmen series, maybe get like 10 or 20 episodes on HBO. I agree with you. I think it's probably a Watchmen series for sure. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised because it doesn't necessarily say that he's directing so maybe he's coming on to produce another movie that idea that they kind of had together and it would make sense anyway considering uh, how tight in that to Snyder is already with all, all the DC properties but yeah I think that it would make sense to it's, it's a good way to extend a little bit more because a lot of people love what Snyder did with Watchmen mm -hmm. and his vision I mean it looks if you go back and you look at the graphic novel it looks like it popped her off the page. I happen to like the graphic novel myself a little bit more mm -hmm. than the actual film, what happened on the film, but I do think that it looked like it just jumped out, and I think that it, it would actually serve for a pretty good series, so I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that's exactly what it's gonna be. Well, and to add on top of that, you know, like let's take, for instance, the Batman v Superman extended cut. That's a, a, almost a three and a half hour cut. <laughs> so what I'm my point in bringing that up is that perhaps Snyder is interested in more long form storytelling. Maybe perhaps he's interested in going in into depth with some of these characters and doing more and maybe feature films right now aren't necessarily the place where he is able to do exactly what he wants to do as a creator or as for his vision. So if it is moving to TV and and I know, you know, people think that I just flat out hate Zack Snyder and that's not true. I love Dawn of the Dead and I like a lot of the visuals that he does in a lot of things. I would be, you know, there's no arguing with him as a visual storyteller and TV is allowing for so much of that now, mm -hmm. especially HBO going into like something like Westworld. They're ambitious. They want these big spectacle things. So if that means that Zack Snyder is on board with something like that, I'm absolutely interested in that. So I hope that that's what it is that they're looking to do. All right, before we move on to buy or sell, we go over to Wendy Lee, who's been looking at the chat room, seeing what's going on in there. Wendy, what's going on in there? All right, for the future of Indiana Jones, the chat says Harrison Ford may be getting too old for the reboot, so let's get Chris Pratt or someone new. Alia C. Johnson says, I wholeheartedly believe that after Indy 5, there should be a retelling of a younger Indy movie, and Mr. Glasses says they're not going to kill him. I just think they're going to get a strong ending to the franchise, and then they might reboot it with Chris Pratt or Bradley uh, Cooper. For The Rock being eyed for The Wolfman, I'm seeing a little bit of rock fatigue, if you yeah. will, uh, from the chat. Just seems like he's got a part in every franchise. Vista Trista 7 says, totally agree with Clark. Love The Rock, but leaning towards someone else for Wolfman, although if this is true, I'd be open to the idea. And finally, for Zack Snyder, working on a new project with Jeff, uh, Jeff Johns, Seems like the chat's also had enough of Snyder for now, saying he needs a co-director or a supervisor to watch over him. And Chatroom Goon says Snyder needs to be able to tell his story without a studio hindering, hindrance of a film. Watchmen needs a longer means of storytelling. Well, thank you, Wendy. We'll be checking back in to see what you guys are saying after buy or sell. And that's where we talk about buy or sell. Natasha's going to read some more topics in the world of movie news. And myself, Clark, and Schnepp are just going to buy or sell them. Natasha, what do we got? Well, the BFG is ready to hit theaters and all eyes are now turned to Steven Spielberg's next movie that he'll direct, the nostalgia film Ready Player One, based on the book of the same name by Ernest Klein. One of the bigger questions now is how Spielberg will confront the nods to his own films that are all over Klein's novel. The book heavily features references to the director-producer's films from the 1980s. During a recent press day for the BFG, Collider's very own Christina Radish spoke to Spielberg about how he will be referencing himself in Ready Player One. 
He said, I think we were pretty awesome in the 80s. I hope the movie returns all of us to the awesomeness of the 80s. I love the 80s. I think one of the reasons I decided to make the movie was that it brought me back to the 80s and lets me do anything I want, except for with my own movies. I've cut most of my movies out of Ernest Cline's book, except for the DeLorean and a couple of other things that I had something to do with. I cut a lot of my own references out of the 80s. I was very happy to see that there was enough without me that made the 80s a great time to grow up. Spielberg will be gearing up for production soon with Ready Player One set for release on March 29th, 2018. Christian Beyer sells Spielberg, Spielberg ignoring references to his own films in Ready Player One, even though they were featured heavily in the source material. I'm going to sell it. Um, because I mean, I, I understand why he would want to do it, but I, I, you know, maybe it looks like he, he doesn't want people to think like, oh, look at Spielberg just putting his own stuff out there and it's more about the movie, but it's part of the book. It's part of the book. It's part of the references and he and his movie are such a big part of the 80s culture that I would have loved to see in a lot uh, of the references and I still think we're still going to see some of them I really do believe we'll get a little more than just the DeLorean uh, but yeah I was bummed out to hear that he's going to make so many cuts and I understand why he's doing it but I'm, I'm still going to buy uh, sell them I buy it. I mean, you know, it's like he's making the film. I mean, he can't just be an ego. Like, <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. But it's, but it's in the book. No, I know. But he, but what he said is, he said, "Look, I'm happy to see that once I removed myself from '80s culture, that it still stood up." So yeah, there's he's you know he's not going to cut out ET. He's not going to cut. There's going to be things that are in there. There's just like, look, all right, all right. Even though he's making it, it's like there's a homage to, like, you know, yeah. look at me, look at me, mirrors and stuff. It's like he's not he's not saying that. He's like, look, I just cut out stuff because I'm making the film. I don't want to get too weird about it. But, you know, the DeLorean's in there. There's going to be a bunch of other stuff. But he, I, there's never going to be an up-close shot of like, zooming in on the E.T. sign. He's not going to over-embrace himself as the book did. But I, I, mean, think, I think it's good. I, I get it, but I still, he had, his movies had such a, Big impact. Yeah, but he's making this. But but it doesn't That's, matter. Isn't that but, enough? Yeah, but he made those <laughs> movies. He made the movies that had the impact on the culture. So like it should. It's meta. He's making the thing about the book about him. But so. he, when he was reading it, it was meta. You know, it's like it's a matter of him <laughs> going, okay, look, that's interesting. I know, but now it's there. meta, meta. I know. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I like to bring everything back to scary things, but if I may, um, you know, think of something like Scream, right. right? You have someone like Wes Craven at the helm. There are nods and references throughout the entire movie to his body of work because mm -hmm. just like Spielberg was to the 80s, Wes Craven was a huge influence in this whole genre that they were, you know, sort of having a little fun with sure. in Scream. I think you can expect very similar type things with Ready Player One. You know, I think that, that you are going to, like you said, Chanel, they're not going Steven Spielberg is not going to erase himself completely from the 80s time frame but I think he's going to be selective mm -hmm. with with what he's yeah. with what he chooses now but with what you were saying Christian I know a lot of people who were thrilled that Spielberg was on board this project simply because you know this was a book that focused so much on or was so heavily influenced by his work yeah. and so you know people said oh great this is the perfect choice so to hear that he's being kind of he's taking himself out of it right. is a little counterintuitive. Right. I think it, it's it, it's going to help the movie. Is how I feel about it. It's like instead of him feeling like oh I'm making little nods to myself, they'll be in the background somewhere. It's like not as for yeah. like, And he can actually give nods to other filmmakers or films that he loved. So from the '80s, and there's so many of them. So I think it's a win-win. So. All right. What's next? When Ben Affleck signed on to star as Batman in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, he had just come off of winning the Best Picture Oscar for Argo and was preparing to direct his Prohibition era drama Live by Night. Everyone agreed that Affleck's presence as a performer in Batman v Superman was impressive, but many film buffs agreed that it was also an interesting move for Affleck the filmmaker. When it came time to reprise his role as Batman in Justice League, Affleck's presence on the film was upped from star to star executive producer, as the latter title was officially given to Affleck a few weeks a few weeks into filming. Many took this as Affleck having a bigger creative presence in the movie in the wake of Batman v Superman's less than stellar reaction. Collider Steve Weintraub visited the Justice League set where the question was put to Affleck, what does his executive producer title mean exactly? He said, why I'm an executive producer is that I'm directing one of the movies, so there's sort of this cross-pollination of story and characters that I don't want to give any of that stuff away, but it basically means that there are 
some things that might happen in my Batman that are affected by, I mean, here we are in the police station in Gotham City. There's a potential that something like this might exist in that story. As for the co-writing with Jeff Johns on the Batman movie and what it means for the Dark Knight movie in the shared universe, Affleck said, so it's a creative way that DC came up with of kind of being a filmmaker driven company and entity and also making sure that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing and so that there's collaboration and supervision so that somebody doesn't go sailing off causing problems for your movie with their movie you know in a way it's also kind of a courtesy you know what they're doing and one hand knows what the other is doing and I get to weigh in on stuff that impacts the Batman stuff. Schnepp, buy or sell Affleck's comments about guiding the Batman movie as an EP on Justice League. That makes sense. I mean, I think he he's a uh, he said everything in, in a very a very nice way what about like you know the handling of Batman in Batman v Superman and how he's it wasn't very happy with the story yet they made they made that movie and he you know as an actor went through with it and then the reaction to it was something that you know he was not a fan of. He's not a, no one no one's a big fan of when your your movie gets tanked you know critically and. Uh, so he wanted to make sure, I mean, you look at his films that he's in charge of, you know, as writing and directing his own films. Um, and he wants to do that with the Batman and make sure that there's a quality control that he has on any future use of the Batman and how it interacts with the film that he's going to be directing, the Batman. So it makes total sense that they upped him to executive producer that he can now weigh in on like, hey, that doesn't make much sense for, you know, the character to do this because, the, you know, it just gives him a little bit more weight and power in the in the in the room of control of making decisions on what happens with not only Batman, but with the Justice League in, in as well, because they're all interconnected, this whole universe. Yeah, I buy the comments. I buy what he said and I buy the way that he said it, because like you said, it was politically the way he said it was very politically correct answer but right. he had to say it in the way that he wanted to show respect to Snyder also he doesn't want to basically say oh I wanted to go in and make sure this guy didn't mess anything up you know right. he, he said things in a way for me when you know that was part of his deal when he was signing on to direct ba the Batman mm -hmm. or when he was signing up it was I want to be involved as an executive producer and these other things so I can basically f have my input felt because I said it, what was it yesterday or the day before he is Warner Brothers golden boy yeah. I mean, as far as directing goes, he's their golden boy, and they—he does have more power than Snyder does, especially after the backlash from from critics and and some fans were saying about the movie. So they're going to want his input, and if he, that's what he asked for, I can't see them really any pushback there. But if you look at the comments, what he was saying, oh, it makes sense that they would make me executive producer because anytime you're kind of connecting universe, well, James Gunn isn't an executive producer on all on all the movies, and 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 you know, like you have Coogler coming in, he's not an executive producer on other movies. They do it sometimes. I know that, that Joss Whedon certainly was. They do it sometimes depending on what you're connecting and they did that with Ultron and um, and I mean even Thor I think maybe. Favreau was an executive yeah, producer. It, it certainly so. happens but yeah. it also happens when they're so connected into everything that's going on and they're almost going to push forward with Affleck almost as the guy who's really leading the charge or anything because the Batman has to he's, he's the one because if, if anyone screws up the Batman in Justice League <sighs> Or it's going to be less of an impact yeah. when that standalone movie comes. So it makes sense that they would do this. Well, I'm so glad you brought up, you know, the the Marvel um, comparison. In this case, I think it's very fitting because I buy what Affleck said. I take him at his word. There isn't a Kevin Feige mm -hmm. at DC overseeing everything. Right. And so what Ben Affleck is saying makes absolute perfect sense. The, if, if there isn't one figure who's overseeing the entire universe and the entire project, then you have to work as a team. Mm -hmm. And so I take him out his word with those comments and I and I buy him and I think I think he's right to say it and I think the way he said it makes perfect sense. All right. What's next? Okay, the first trailer for Meg, Ma oh, sorry, Meg Matola, Greg Matola's <laughs> action comedy Keeping Up with the Joneses dropped yesterday and stars a Gal Gadot and John Hamm as the Joneses, a glamorous, sophisticated, picture perfect couple who move into a perfectly ordinary suburb. After the couple moves in, they end up dazzling their new neighbors, especially Jeff, played by Zach Galifianakis, and Karen, played by Isla Fisher. What Jeff and Karen don't realize right away is that the Joneses are spies. The movie also stars Patton Oswalt, Matt Walsh, Kevin Dunn, and Meredith Monroe. Keeping Up with the Joneses opens on October 21st. Clark, buy or sell the first trailer for Keeping Up with the Joneses. Well, I'm going to reluctantly buy this, but I'm going to keep my receipt so I can return it in 30 days. 
Um, look, I love this cast. This is an incredible cast. And I, I Greg Matola did super bad. I love super bad. Not only is it hilarious, it's incredibly heartfelt. So I have high hopes for something like this. Um, this trailer is very formulaic to me. I'm not seeing anything sparkly in it. I'm seeing Mr. and Mrs. Smith, except with their neighbor. They're your neighbors now or whatever it is. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, I have, I want this to be good. And by the way, I didn't even recognize Zach Galifianakis a minute into this. And I interviewed him recently in person and I didn't recognize him when he sat down at the table. He, so that was a mind trip. But, uh, but yeah, I, I buy the movie and I hope I don't return it later. I'm going to buy it. I think it does look like Mr. and Mrs. Smith had a baby with the burbs. Um, and mm. if, but I, the thing is, I don't mind formulaic when the laughs are there in a comedy. Like mm -hmm. if a lot of these comedies sometimes, I've seen it a million times before, but is it funny? Am I gonna get the laughs? And I, I'll be honest, I laughed a bunch of times and it was Galifianakis made me laugh the majority of the time. I like him more when he's this, you know, he usually plays the bumbling dude a lot, but when it's not mean, because I think that's where they got away, because Alan in the first Hangover was really funny. Then they started to make him really mean in two and three, and I, I really started to dislike him the most out of all mm -hmm. the characters. But when he plays characters like this, and even when he's screaming about, flip the cookies, flip the cookies, I'm, I'm laughing. <laughs> yeah. He's running into the glass. These are the kind of stuff I want to see Galifianakis do. That's and I think right. it's a perfect role for Gadot and for John Hamm, because you know John Hamm can play that assassin type character, but still throw those laughs in there with a the straight face. Mm -hmm. I think this movie could could work, and I and I'm I'm optimistic, and I like the release date of September. I think it's a perfect time to put that kind of movie in there. And Matola is a guy that I would also like to see direct this type of movie, so I'm gonna buy it. Yeah, I totally buy this. I was laughing out loud. I literally just saw it a few minutes ago, and I I loved it. It is Neighbors meets the the Smiths, but to me, so what? If I mean, if the if the trailer alone can make you laugh, I like literally laughed at every mm -hmm. whatever you want to say formulaic beat that they threw in there. I, I was like so hook, line, and sinker suckered in. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the film based off this trailer. I totally buy the trailer, and it looks fun. I mean, I don't, to me, it's it's it is sometimes fun when studios are like, let's put this in a blender. What if we take this and this and and then it works, especially if you get the kind of uh, actors that they have. They have the star talent to pull it off. So Natasha, you were checking out the trailer. With yeah. Before, what'd you think? Um, well, I buy it just for Gal Gadot and John Hamm together because they are such a beautiful couple. Mm -hmm. So that's like my dream couple right there. But um, I think it was funny. I was genuinely laughing. Loved all of Zach Galifianakis's jokes. Mm -hmm. The part where he like leaves his wife. I'm like, that is something that like you were just you running know, away. Yeah. yeah, that is something that like start. he would do. Yeah. So I'm excited and I'm ready for that movie. All right, now we turn to Wendy. Wendy, what are they saying in the chat room during our buy or sell topics? Well, for Ready Player One, is, I'm seeing a lot of buys for this movie and for the 80s references, but they're selling Spielberg, ignoring his old films. Christopher Skaliki says, this bumps me out about Ready Player One. I'm sure it'll still be good, and but I love the book, and there's so many great references on there. We shall see. And Jay Converse 66 says, that book has plenty of 80s references already. Spielberg has to be referenced in there for sure, but it would not hurt the movie. For the Ben Affleck story, uh, the chat room spying this, saying Affleck can really help with the DC universe. Colin Pickle says Affleck could help with the storytelling elements that Batman v Superman was lacking. And finally, for the first trailer for Keeping Up with the Joneses, and while uh, Gal Gadot looks smoking hot, the chat room is selling the trailer. A lot of it just, a lot of them just found it. It's not funny. Eric Jones says I sell the trailer. It gave away like 85 percent of the movie. Wow, so. I cannot believe that the chat is on my side for the first uh -huh. time in the history <laughs> of movie talk. Um, Thank you, chat. And then shout out, by the way, to Chris Galicki, who's apparently in the chat room too. He is our writer for all these Schmodown questions. So oh. Chris Galicki Good is in job. the chat room. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, <laughs> now it's time for opening this week, brought to you by our friends over at AMC Theaters. Natasha, what is opening this week? Well, we have a jam-packed segment. We've got Independence Day Resurgence. Using recovered extraterrestrial technology, the nations of Earth collaborate on an immense defense program to protect the planet. When the aliens attack with unprecedented force, only the ingenuity of a few brave men and women can save the world. And we've got Swiss Army Man being stranded 
stranded on a deserted island leaves young Hank, played by Paul Dano, bored, lonely, and without hope. As a rope hangs around his neck, Hank prepares to end it all until he suddenly spots a man, played by Daniel Radcliffe, laying by the shore. Unfortunately, he is dead and quite flatulent, using the gassy body to his advantage. <laughs> Hank miraculously... I knew it was coming. <laughs> Hank miraculously makes it back to the mainland. However, he now finds himself lost in the wilderness and dragging the talking corpse named Manny along for the adventure. And lastly, we have the Neon Demon. Beauty-obsessed models become jealous of a 16-year-old Elle Fanning who takes the fashion world by storm in Los Angeles. Okay, so let's start with the big one with Independence Day Resurgence. Now, we haven't... This hasn't screened for critics yet. That's usually a, a rough sign. I had heard a few days ago from someone who had seen it that it was the worst sequel that they ever seen. Right, do the imitation. I can't. And I, right, I, I right, can't right. do that imitation. Right. <laughs> but um, but I can also say that then I heard from other people, and there's other reviews that are coming out, that said it's exactly the hit yourself in the head with a hammer type of just eat some popcorn, enjoy yourself watching it. That is the type of movie I want it to be. That's the kind of movie I'm hoping it's going to be. So I, I'm still optimistic going into Independence Day that it's just going to be that big, over-the-top, watch the aliens come in, we're going to fight them and send them back to wherever they came. So that's what I'm kind of hoping to see from that one. Now, if now we go into... I still want to see Swiss Army Man. I oh, hear yeah. some crazy things about that movie. Obviously, the, 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 the premise alone... <laughs> I was at Sundance when it was premiering. I didn't get a chance to see it, um, but from what I did hear, people that saw it were just kind of blown away by it, no pun intended, and, <laughs> I, and also, but some people were walking out of the theater, and they just couldn't take how silly it was. Now, ne the Neon Demon, I'm going to let you guys talk about, because I haven't seen this, but I will say that I thought Drive was good. I didn't love Only God Forgive, so I'm very curious your take on the Neon Demon. Is Clark, start with you. Let's sure. start with that one. Is that something people should be looking forward to? You know, the Neon Demon is not going to be for everyone. I feel like this is a divisive weekend yeah. for movies, just yeah. in general. Um, but I very, very much liked the Neon Demon. I liked it a lot. Um, it is, you know, I've been read. I find it to be a very personal movie. Uh, I find it to be rather authentic and yet also very uh, slightly campy. It's a dark film in, with no, out of question. And, um, it, but it's not gonna be for everyone. So the, what I would say, and we talked about it on Nightmares, if you're interested, you can kind of um, head on over to our episode of Nightmares where we get into this and other uh, horror movies that take place in Hollywood. Um, but you know, I would say that where Drive, I think, explores a masculine male kind of violence, I think the Neon Demon explores a female feminine kind of violence. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is it's gorgeous. It looks absolutely beautiful. I just take issue with the people that say it's all style, no substance. I do think that there's more going on beneath the surface. Oh, there's a, a ton going on beneath the surface. I think The Neon Demon is a fantastic film. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I can't wait to see it again. And I'm a fan of Nicholas Winning Re Revan. I like all of his films. And uh, I, I agree with Clark that this is this is a female take on uh, on competitiveness and violence and narcissism. Um, and it's told from you know a man's perspective who's not even in this world of Hollywood. So it also has this kind of like made up fairy tale mm -hmm. uh, uh, style to it. So it's definitely like like she said, it's not for everyone. Nor is Swiss Army Knife, but I, uh, Swiss Army Man. <laughs> but I cannot wait to see that. I watched the trailer again yesterday and was, I could not stop laughing. It's just so silly and so fantastical and over the top and creepy and weird and strange seeing Daniel Radcliffe as a dead person just talking but everything he's saying you know is coming from Paul Dano's weird frenzied mind so that is a movie I cannot I cannot wait to see Independence Day for years now I like still calling it ID forever the dumbest title in the world yeah. but they finally changed it to Independence Day been Research. griping about this movie for years and I kind of whistled a different tune after I saw like that five minute extendo Jeff Goldblum look we've got a base on the moon I was like all right screw it I'm in this big dumb movie I'm gonna go watch it uh, and we're gonna see it tonight a whole group of us are all going to the AMC 16 to go sweat it out and watch the aliens fight and then Bill Pullman as a bearded president come back and say the same lines again and say probably see the same things again right. but on a bigger dumber budget so um, I certainly hope it's fun I am gonna smash my head with a popcorn hammer and uh, you know <laughs> try to be it. as stupid as possible like I, it can't be worse than Transformers 4 so or could it oh, who yeah. knows well we're gonna find out yeah. tonight my friend it's yes. gonna be fun so those are 
are the movies that are opening up. Again, thank you. Brought to you by our friends over at AMC Theater. Those are the movies opening this week. Now it's time to move into, well, before we get into mailbag, I do want to bring up that we have a really big match happening on the Schmodown tomorrow, and that is between Jeff Snyder against Sam Levine. Ooh. It is a pay-per-view type matchup, and the reason I bring it up is because the winner of that match plays Clark Wolf. Yeah. That is going to be, now, Clark, who, who do you got in this match? What do you think? I don't want to face either of them, to be honest really with good. you. Um, Sam has an encyclopedic knowledge of movies. I listened to him on his podcast with Kevin Pollack, and he knows everything. Mm -hmm. And I know Jeff Snyder, and Jeff Snyder knows his stuff, too. So, I honestly, I think this is like a toss-up. I, I, I can't. I can't. I can't even choose. Right. I can't I'll, choose. I'll choose one. Like, look, I went against... That was the first time I came on Schmodown oh, yeah. with it was me and Mance and who oh, we else? played the, we played a movie and game. And I think yeah, Riley was clips. like oh, yeah, the yeah, three yeah. of us yeah. against Sam Levine and it was like literally there was no against it was just us losing and him winning because he has this mutant like power to hear like the beginning the wisp of a and he's like I know the movie you're like they didn't even say anything yet so you right. just heard a breath you weirdo what and he names the film and he got it and it was like one of those things where you just feel like this is unfair like it's rigged it's a it's not even a real game it's like they gave him the answers he's it's impossible good. he's that good yeah. it's freakish and strange and I and I went to a convention and I, I remember hanging out with him I was like so dude what's up what you know how what what's going on he's like well I just hung out and stayed in my house my entire childhood I had like I, all I did was watch movies and re-watch the same VHS and so he has this stuff burned into his memory I don't think Schneider does that's uh, pretty good no no I know he's good but like not the but way I Sam don't is. think it's like this kind you of call mutant. Him the mutant yeah, yeah I call him the mutant he's like this freakish insane like he's just gonna be like every single before Schneider can even before he can even breathe the answer will be blasted out so I, I'm in a, I'm saying the uh, Sam Levine all right well I'm gonna go with Snyder by that much. Really? I mean, yeah, I think he knows. I think he knows a lot more than people give him credit for. But we'll see. Again, that happens tomorrow at 2 p.m. Make sure you check that one out. Now we move into mailbag where you guys have been submitting questions, collider video at gmail.com. We've been going through them and now we're going to answer them. Natasha, what's up first? Robert Duvon writes, Hey, Collider crew from Birmingham. With The Shallows arriving this weekend, I was wondering what was the best movie set in one slash very few locations? My choice would be 127 Hours or Buried. And also on an unrelated topic, as an aspiring indie filmmaker, what do you think is the best indie flick in recent years? And do you think the indie genre is dying with less and less indies really making headlines these days stay shit ratting on <laughs> uh, i don't think that the indie indies are dying i think that we there's still a lot of them made all the time it says they are certainly getting less notice as far as releases go and it, it, just more vod yes a lot more that's that's the point is there's a lot more that goes vod but they're certainly being made all the time um i'm gonna go with the location question first i think reservoir dogs is mm -hmm. one for me i mean mm -hmm. it, you got about two maybe three locations in that movie but focusing mostly on the warehouse which is a movie that always stands out for me so i'll go with reservoir dogs um schnepp how about sure. you sure reservoir dogs is mine but I, i'll also go with moon oh, which is a, uh, it's, it's literally one space station location it's got a couple of different outside locations but uh, it really is a, and you never feel cramped in it as far as like you're not moving around enough. So, moon. Oh, and I'll go as far as the last indie that I, think I love the most um, Lock. Mm. Uh, oh, Lock. Which is great. also one location, by in, the way. You're so in a car. You're in a car yeah. the whole time. I thought that Tom Hardy should have absolutely been nominated for that film. Um, my answer kind of works for both, and it's The Babadook. Mm. Um, the Babadook mostly takes place in the house that this woman and her child live in, and it was an independent movie that the director, Jennifer Kent, kickstarted. kickstarted. I think she made it for $30,000. So for you indie filmmaker who is discouraged or disappointed, if you make a good movie, it's going to get out there. It's going to right i have to believe that i do believe that that if you make something good people will find it well, let me also you mentioned that and that made me think of the evil dead a cabin in the woods yep. oh, bam simple yeah. simple keep it and simple ex machina which ex machina also, exactly yeah, a, little, a little bigger budget uh, yeah. but still but, but still, still yeah, a house with a couple of corridors yeah. you know 
Uh, okay, what's next? Adam Sandoval writes, do you guys think that Independence Day 2 can crack $100 million or even $150 million when it's tracking so poorly? Before you give me the shit rat face, let me explain. Jurassic World opened with over $200 million because it is a well-known property that's been in the public mind for over 20 years with sequels, DVDs, and being on TV. And two, Star Wars The Force Awakened opened with almost $250 million for some of the same reasons as Jurassic World. I know it won't open with Star Wars or Jurassic World numbers, but I think it does have some of the same factors that may be able to help the film open as big as 100 million or 150 million. What do you guys think? I don't think it's opening at 100 million. Do I think it'll make 100 million for sure? Yeah, I think that it's. It was maybe a lot of people think a little too late that this movie is coming out. I think there are some people who are very excited for it. I think that some people are going to feel the way that we are, like we just want to have fun with it and they're going to see him. But I think this movie is going to do like 65 million maybe opening weekend uh it's not tracking that well because there's a when independence day came out in 96 it that genre was on the top of i mean that was that was the only game in town you didn't have the marvel movies you didn't have star wars movies you didn't have dc movies you didn't have all these the the, the big budget movie was very different than what it is today the mm-hmm. franchise was very different than what it is today so i i do think that it's gonna open lower and i even from the mixed reviews that we're getting so far i don't think that the buzz on it is going to really get people in the theater to uh to see that so i don't i don't think it's going to happen and, and i don't and i it's just it's just very different with jurassic world and star wars have different names and brand recognition than independence day does so yeah i just don't see it doing <coughs> it but schnepp as the former Oracle, because I think uh, John Roca has used a title for now. That's right. Um, what What do you uh, What do you think? I don't think it's going to make a hundred million this weekend, but yeah. you know, I mean, it really depends on like you know, not so much as what critics are saying because no one's had a chance to really review it. It's really going to depend on what the audience is from seeing all these kinds of commercials and a, kind of a relentless amount of featurettes and little things about Independence Day. And from everything I've been hearing, people are like, yeah, you know, it's I wouldn't mind seeing that. So it really depends on the weekend. And there's not a lot of other films opening for it to fight against. So. Dory is having its second weekend, though. Well, I don't think I think it'll beat Dory. I don't think so. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, think it so. will. Okay. Um, so I don't think I don't think it's going to. With all due respect, oh Oracle, oh, I, I don't right. think it's going to beat Dory this weekend. Um, but you know, I think you, you're seeing a couple of things here. I do think that this question ha- makes a very very good point. Um, I just was looking at because I was filling in for Sasha over doing something at Screen Junkies, and I looked at these original like films where you see the first Ninja Turtles movie that came out a few years ago, mm-hmm. or the first Star Wars movie, or the first. Jurassic World movie and and they make these huge numbers I think because audiences are hungry for that it's the novelty of seeing it again um, however those were all big franchises beforehand keep in mind Independence Day is one movie just one and I think for a lot of people Independence Day is Will Smith and now that we don't have Will Smith there, there's that now I am a huge fan of the first movie. I'm excited for the second movie. I want to see the second movie. But I do think that the marketing campaign for this movie has been very weird. You know, yes, they're inundating us with commercials and featurettes and behind the scenes things on YouTube. But where, I mean, maybe it's, where is their cast? Has the cast been out there doing anything? I mean... I don't know. No, it's, it's because there's quiet. they're not having a junket. Yeah. You know, they're the it's almost like the studio is hiding the movie yeah. in plain sight. And mm-hmm. I feel like that's very weird and not a good omen or doesn't inspire confidence in a movie going on. I agree with you. I think that it would it no junket, no press screenings. It just means that they're preying on people wanting to see based off the past name, but that doesn't give you enough oomph to really get the word out there and to promote it to get you that 100 150 million dollar opening. Jurassic World Star Wars had big marketing pushes, even though you didn't. There was a lot of secrecy, obviously, behind Star Wars, but they all had. You you knew when Jurassic World, you knew who was in the movie. They, they a lot of promotion beforehand. You're not getting this with this movie, and they screened it. Both those movies, Star Wars and Jurassic World. I mean, we got to see a Star Wars a week or a week and a half before. You got right. to see Jurassic World about a week, two weeks before. It's it's a bad sign. So we're gonna find out. We'll see tomorrow exactly what the numbers are gonna look like. But what do you think? So. What do you like? What do you think the weekend number for Independence Day? Like? Uh, well. I'll tell 
tell you, I think that Dory's going to be, because Dory opened at what, 140 or something? 135. 135. I think Dory's going to push in around 75. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, Independence Day is around 63 to 64 million. How about you, Claire? I I know this is going to sound silly, but I would put a, I bet a dollar on that. So I think it's going to be below what you're predicting, Uh um, but I don't. Both of them? No, no, no. I think Just it's going to be below. Independence Day is going to be low, si- below 60. I think it's really not going to perform the way that the studio wants it to. I mean, I don't want to be. I mean, part of me, part of me even thinks maybe high 40s. Like, I wow. think this is wow. going to be a bomb. Like a bomb. Well, think about Warcraft, for goodness sake. I mean, Warcraft, I, you know, one of the biggest game franchises ever. And uh, and Warcraft opened with less than 30 million in the States. Yeah, but Warcraft didn't have, I mean, look, it, have, it was one of the most popular games of all right. time. There's no but doubt about that. that doesn't translate. That doesn't translate all the time. But as, as much as a very popular first movie does, even in pop culture. 20 years ago. 20 years ago. But, I mean, you Without watch. Without Will Smith. Yeah, but it's still got a brand recognition. It's still, it's still a sequel that people had fun with the first time it came out. So I, I think it'll do better than four. I wouldn't be shocked, but I still think it'll do better than four. I'm going to go the it. other way and say it'll probably go over 60. Mm. Okay, That's so my guess. I, like, I think it'll beat Dory okay. just because because of its the 20-year anniversary. It's right around Independence, Independence Day. Not much else is opening. It's some people are going to take that chance, especially with no critical response, really. They're going to be like, look, why not? So I think that why not kind of let's all go out and see a big dumb movie yeah. could actually you work. know what I would are I would bet that I think the why not people are going to go see Central Intelligence again. Interesting. Really? All right. Well, now it's time to hear from you guys. We're going to take about two Twitter questions because we're running out of time. So Natasha, they have been tweeting at Collider Video. What have they been asking? Mm-hmm. OK, D Knighton asks with Pacific Rim one and two Godzilla one and two Power Rangers Skull Island Godzilla versus Kong is the kaiju genre emerging? Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you mm-hmm. think, Schnapp? Sure. Sounds like it. Yeah, it does sound like I it. mean, you know, we're definitely going to see kaijus in uh, in the Power Rangers movie, and I'm sure there'll be a little bit better than the you know the the television series which is a rubber monster attack them kill them you know it's going to be a little bit more advanced i can't wait to see pacific rim too i'm so excited that they're getting that chance especially thanks to china that's the whole reason it's happening so i think uh you know we are seeing the rise of the kaiju and the kaiju monsters uh let's get get on gamera and then we'll finally we'll say yes it's back so yeah i think they're taking a shot at it like you said we'll see how it does in the next couple of movies and i think they're definitely taking a crack at it yeah yeah, agree. Okay, last one. Okay, Kyle Lopez asks, what are some of your favorite 80s teen movies? Mine are Better Off Dead, Footloose, and Real Genius. Oh. Teen Wolf! I love That's right. Teen Ferris Wolf. Bueller's Day Off. Teen Wolf, you want to see a little trivia question for you. What's the coach's name in Teen Wolf? Go ahead and put it in there, see if you know. The coach. The coach. Man, all I remember is Boof. I love Boof. The coach's name is Bobby Finstock. Is it really? <laughs> oh, that nice. makes so much what, sense now. Uh, you got what do you got? I said Ferris Bueller. Ferris Bueller, yeah, yeah absolutely. Because you're in the movie. No, I love the film. <laughs> <laughs> and also because like, I'm in the movie. Yeah. No, I, 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 maybe I I'll throw out Sixteen Candles. I oh, think that great. one's still yeah. very funny. I just rewatched that again with Holly. Ho- yeah. loved it. It's, yeah, it stands up. Yeah, it's still funny. All right, before we sign off, Wendy, what were they saying in the chat room about either the mailbag or the past Twitter questions? Well, for Mailbag, uh, best movie set in one or very few locations. I have Glengarry Glenn Ross, mm. Room, 12 Angry Men, Cube, Ex Machina, and Saw. And for favorite 80s teen movies, Breakfast Club and Weird Science. Nice. Nice. Okay, great. Guys, thank you so much for joining us once again here on Movie Talk. I would like to thank the panel that joined me today, The Schnepp Man. Where can they find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram just at John Schnepp. I'm going to go to CatCon this Sunday, so come on. Let's like, look at cats and weird cat products on Sunday here in L.A. And then the following weekend, I'll be at uh, Florida Supercon sweating out with all the Miami freaky nerds. And uh, then San Diego Comic-Con, so that's, that's about it. Classy Clark Wolf, where can they find you? You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Clark Wolf. Clark with an E, Wolf in the knee. You can find me in Heroes Old Spot oh, yeah. every oh, yeah. Tuesday. Tuesday. Where's John Schnepp? I'm Wednesday Collider Heroes, Clark's Tuesday Nightmares. Woo-hoo. You can find me and John Schnepp and Perry Nemiroff and Mark Riley on uh, Tuesdays on Collider Nightmares for all of your genre needs. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Natasha Martinez, where can they find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. 
And guys, I also want to let you know that the Top 10 show is going to be debuting on June 29th with Matt Nost and John Roca. They're going to be doing the Top 10 Spielberg movies. Make sure you check that out. We'll tell you way more about it as we get closer. Jedi Council goes up today. A lot of talk about the Rogue One reveals and then the Schmoes show tonight, live 7 to 9 on the Schmoes channel. Please check that out. And like I mentioned before, Levine versus Snyder. That goes down tomorrow. Make sure you follow Wendy Lee over there, please, at Wendy Lee Zaney. And then you guys can check us out every day here on Movie Talk. See you tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.